Hello everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Camille Meir and I'm on the events team at the bookstore and I'm thrilled to be welcoming Sean Desmond to present his new novel, Sophomores, in conversation with journalist Tom Juno. While the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, um, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days. So I want to give a huge thanks to Sean and Tom for joining us this evening. So quickly to housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot hear or see you. So if you have a question, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit your question. We will try to get through as many questions as we can at the end of the program. There's also a chat button where I will be posting a link to purchase tonight's book, Sophomores. So please keep an eye out for that during the event and make sure to click the link and buy the book. Um, one caveat for tonight's event, we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads, so please bear with any technical issues that might arise. We will try to solve them as quickly as possible. Uh, we will be continuing our virtual series across the winter and spring, so make sure to head over to our website, communitybookstore.net, and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date on all of our events. One that I want to point out is that this coming Thursday, so in just a couple of days, We'll be thrilled to welcome Dorothy Gallagher to present her new book, Stories I Forgot to Tell You, in conversation with Susan Minot, part which will be part of our ongoing series with the New York Review of Books. Uh, registration for that event is live right now, so please check it out on our website and register. So just a little bit now about our authors and we'll get started. Um, Sean Desmond is the publisher of 12, an imprint of Grand Central, and he has been in the publishing world for more than 25 years. His first novel, Adam's Fall, was published in 2000 and was adapted into the film Abandon. Sean currently lives in Brooklyn, New York. Tom Juneau has written some of the most enduring journalism of the past few decades, from his profile of Fred Rogers to his meditation on 9-11 called The Falling Man. He worked as a writer for Esquire and is now a senior writer at ESPN. He has won two National Magazine Awards, as well as the James Beard Award for essay writing. He's working on his first book, a memoir, of, a memoir of his father, and he lives in Marietta, Georgia. Sean and Tom, the virtual stage is now yours. Thanks so much, Camille. Thank you. Hey, Sean. Hey, Tom. How's it going? Great. Thanks for doing this. It's such a pleasure. Well, thanks for writing your book. I, I figure I'm, I'm, I might as well get this out of the way from the very beginning. I really loved your book. Um, and I loved it in a, in a way that I, I don't know, it's, it really, um, and I hope this doesn't sound, you know, like fuddy-duddy, but I mean, I thought that the book was, gave a lot of like the, like the, the reasons, it offered a lot of the, uh, me a lot of the reasons that I got into reading in the first place. Um, it kind of just gave me, um, you know, an almost an old fashioned kick. I mean, there were people in the book that I really loved and there were, um, there were people in the book that I wound up really rooting for. And it, it just, it just made me understand all over again, um, the value of novels, um, you know, especially of, of even of novels or especially the novels of autobiographical material. I am writing a memoir and I have found that as I write the memoir that novels help me write memoirs, write the memoir a lot more than memoirs do. They give me, they give me the, you know, they give me more fuel than other memoirs do. And so I, I just wanted to start with the question. So why did you, given the autobiographical nature of the book, why did you write a novel instead of a memoir? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks again, Tom, for doing this, and and it's a great question. And also, I just wanted to say thanks to everybody on the Zoom, thanks to the community bookstore, my team at Putnam, my family, everyone, everyone tuning in tonight. I really appreciate it. It's such an exciting pub day for me to share this book with you, and uh, I'm just really grateful for it. Um, so thanks, Tom. And so, you know, I I did start this novel in a more autobiographical form. Um, it is autobiographical, it draws from my life. The characters are similar to the people in my family, um, my friends, my teachers. And um, to be honest, like I've always wanted to write a novel and I've always wanted to express myself that way. Um, 
but there's also the sort of the mechanics of trying to get 15, 16 year old boys around the city of Dallas. So I had to age them a little bit to get them in a car, move them around, conflate and compact and compile my entire high school experience and all the crazy stories and things that happened to us. Um, so the novel gave me a little bit more freedom, but to be honest, the, the basic answer or the root answer to why I wrote a novel rather than a memoir is because I wanted these characters who are based on people who I love deeply and admire so much. I wanted them to express themselves. I wanted to see where they wanted to go and let people walk a mile in their shoes. It's, it's the thing that, that struck me um, again and again uh, reading, reading the book was the love that you have for the characters, uh, the empathy that you have for the characters. And given how close the characters are to your own life and your own experience, um, I'm curious as to how it felt like, what it felt like when you started writing from their point of view. Good question. Um, you know, a funny thing happened on the, on the way to this book. I started in one place with Dan Malone, a 15 year old sophomore who was going to, you know, sort of talents hidden below a bushel. And he was going to run into Mr. Oglesby, who's based on my real life uh, English teacher. And he's going to flip the switch, right? And, and awaken him to the world of ideas, literature, reading, writing, what's important in life. And as I wrote that, that stuff is still there. Some of the great scenes in the book that I loved writing, I really enjoyed that because Mr. Oglesby was very Socratic and that makes great dialogue back and forth, always asking questions, always pushing, always doing weird stuff in the classroom. But as I kept going, um, for lack of a better term, my parents took over. The characters of Anne and Pat Malone started to take over the book. And then as I got towards the end, Pat Malone really uh, yeah. over the book and took over my thinking, not just thinking about my father and thinking about his voice in my head, but now to go full circle, I'm a father and I relate now a lot more. Um, and so there was that interesting sort of like swing from trying to think like a 15 year old boy to relating to this more mature character. And it sort of took over in a way, um, which was really kind of interesting. You can feel that. I'm going to, later on, I'm going to read, there's a section that I really want to read and, and to find out how you did it. But I guess the, the thing that, you know, that I want to make sure that all of our um, listeners uh, know is that the, I mean, one of the significant um, issues in the book is your father's or, or the, the um, Dan's father's alcoholism, which is, um, written unsparingly but sympathetically um, at the same time. Now, a lot of memoir writing is driven by, by wounds, you know, by primal wounds. Um, um, in this book, is, is, is that a wound that's, that's driving your, your writing and your, and your um, portrayal of, of the character of the father? I think it is. I think, it, you know, the drinking is sort of like, uh, like in the old uh, Greek stories, it's, it's, it's the curse that repeats through the family. Right. And so um, I think that I, as someone myself who is a recovering alcoholic and now nine years sober, I have to say that the father character, again, um, is a conflation or, or compiling both the father and the son, both my feelings about, okay. about both, about both. And so, um, so it is written unsparingly because it's something that I both personally went through, but also um, I spend a lot of time in, in, in groups and, and talking to other people about recovery. And it's uh, um, not to be too cheesy about it, but like what happens to Pat Malone over the course of this is the bottoming out and then eventually hopefully for everyone who has this problem you just hit the last lines of amazing grace you know i when when once i was blind now i can see and i think towards the end of the book what's really great about his character is that he can he he, he sort of sees it he gets yeah. it. 
and uh, that's the that's the miracle of recovery. It's one of the things. Another yet another thing that I love about the book is that you you let the reader see a glimpse of the recovery, but you don't bring him there. You don't you bring him to that threshold but not over it so that you don't know, the reader doesn't know at the end exactly what's going to be. And, you know, of course, that is one of the things that, once again, that novels do that sort of draw you in. I mean, you can almost feel, even just as I'm talking about it right now, I can feel that suction into that, into that kind of blessed uncertainty that's there still at the end of the novel. Yeah. Um, it is up in the air. <laughs> literally, quite literally. What was the yeah. what was the first section that you wrote in either the um the father's point of view or or the mother's uh your mother's? Well, I have to um I have to say that Anne Malone is a special character, okay? Based on the character of my mother. Yeah. I think is who is who I think is watching right now, possibly, right? Possibly lurking in the yeah. in, in the group here. Um, you but, better have a question. Is all I'm saying. <laughs> um, but listen, um, Anne Malone's a terrific character in the sense that she's based on a woman who was my first teacher. Um, she, uh, Anne Malone. I'll talk about the character so it's not confusing to people. Okay. Anne Malone is sort of born in the South Bronx, Irish immigrant parents brought up in a very sort of mid, uh, you know, mid 20th century, severe Irish Catholic upbringing, right? Smart as a whip, raised, uh, went to Cathedral High School, went on to Fordham Hunter and got her PhD at, at, um, at Fordham in psychology. And, but, but in a very, a woman who like has a lot of faith, right? And so the, the, the great thing about writing about that character was that this is someone who is an independent thinker, who knows that the structures of society that she grew up in are wrong, right? There's things about the church that are wrong. There are things about our politics that are wrong. Um, and there's the ways that society treats women that she's always struggling against as a feminist. So I, I love this character. I admire this character. This is a character who might after a couple of pops after dinner, maybe call the parish priest and let him have it for a, for a homily that wasn't really uh, on point about women's rights. I love uh, Anne Malone and I love writing about her. And, uh, and then she goes later into the book. She's on this famous murder trial, which we can talk about, but she, 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 she faces this crisis of faith. And so it's a question of an independent thinker, like, what do you believe? We know how to question, but what do you believe? And how can you judge others? And can people change? In regard to the trial that, that forms one of the spines of the book, number one, did that trial really happen? Um, are the names of the people the same? And, and it's one of the things, um, the novel is written with so much care um, you get so much right, um, both in seemingly offhand descriptions and also just in the portrayal of, of that time. Um, how did you do that? And did you, did you research it in, in order to get there? And what kind of value did you place on that while you were writing it? Great question. So there is a, a murder trial in the book. It is fictionalized, but it's based largely just in an autobiographical manner, the characters are. This trial is based largely on a very famous Dallas murder trial in the 80s, um, which involved Walker Rayleigh, who was a Methodist minister from the Park Cities, and his wife, who was uh, Peggy, who was a teacher at Ursuline, which was the Catholic girls' school um, that um, was down the block from Jesuit. And uh, Peggy was found strangled in her driveway. She went into a coma and she never really recovered. And 25 years later, God bless her, but um, she passed away. And the trial was a media storm in Dallas because you had, you had classic tropes from, uh, from like out of like out of the Scarlet Letter, right? You had the fallen minister who had, a, who had an adulterous relationship, the silent victim and his wife. Um, 
and then like a lack of real concrete evidence, even though the, all signs pointed towards him. So I did a lot of research on this trial. I went back, um, I recommend anyone who reads the book, if they wanna read about the real story to read, Lawrence Wright, can't get to it, can't get a better Texas writer than that. Uh, he wrote a piece for Texas Monthly called The Sins of Walker Raley. And he goes into the unknowability of this guy um, and how you, um, he walks around uh, seemingly guilty, but not proven so. And so this is the crisis of faith for Ann Desmond, who has like, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry, mom, Ann Malone, who has a, uh, who has a uh, crisis of faith, is tested by it and um, serves on the jury for this murder. Um, so I did a lot of research that I read as many books as I could that mentioned the Walker Raley case. There are a couple of sort of pulpy crime books about it, but I did a lot of going back into the 80s and trying to get the details of the night, um, all of the suspicious stuff. It, it, it's all laid out in a jury room in the book. And I think, uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's a good stem winder. I, to be honest with you, it's like one of the better plotted pieces of the book in my my humble. Yeah, life. no, it's it it definitely it definitely keeps. I mean, you have you have several plots going, and, and that is that is something that definitely draws you along as a reader. Um, so, why the '80s, other than the fact that you lived it? Um, had did you ever think of setting this book at a different time? And is there something about the 80s that is important to what you're trying to say and do in the book? Great question. I do have to give credit to writers now because what's great about writing about the 80s and why I think you see such a nostalgia for it, no cell phones, no internet. Sure. Your characters have to like literally be on stage in order to communicate. The phone is there obviously, and there's the TV and what have you, but it's like a simpler way of dealing yeah, right, right. with the plotting of stuff. So I, I, I definitely thought about putting this in different time periods and um, I actually moved up the experience to my sophomore year. I'm, I think I'm a year off and folks on, the, folks on the Zoom chat can correct me from my high school and whatever. I think we're in 87, I was actually a freshman, but I moved it up a year again for mechanics and the, and the mm -hmm. plot, which is to have the kids have a somebody who's old enough to drive and stuff like that. What I really loved about late Reagan Dallas is that it's like sort of like a consummate or a consummate example of like the culture shifting. Um, Dallas is coming into its own out of sort of the J.R. Ewing heyday. Um, we're entering into like the end of the Cold War um, and uh, the baby boomer generation that taught me and that I wanted to honor in this book and I want to talk about these teachers um, are, you know, are, are the ones sort of in charge of things and not to babble too much about it, but Dallas at that point is on the cusp of like finding all of its different alternative cultures as opposed to the one monoculture that you think of, which is that TV show Dallas, right? Where you have the oil drill and the big hats and uh, sort of the melodrama, which by the way, I love Dallas, great show. <laughs> but, but Dallas is becoming an international city at this time. And I thought that was like an interesting thing um, and an interesting time to explore. Well, so this is, so I lived in Dallas in the early eighties before I was a writer. And um, this is like the first book that I've ever read that's like about Dallas, <laughs> you know, about first novel I've ever read that's about Dallas anyway. And uh, and I was I was amazed um, by how um, evocative it was for a city that to me was even when I was living there always seemed like the opposite of it evoked nothing in a lot of different ways. But yet yet your book was was very evocative of time and place. And Dallas has like an um, has an amazing culture to itself that I can point to some examples of like great Dallas like Dr. T and his women which is a late Robert Altman movie, yeah. great example of Dallas culture. Um, there's, there's things about Dallas that um, you, have to, you have to get in pieces, right? Like North Dallas 40 and, and, and uh, there's pieces of it, but like, you're right there. And also Lawrence Wright, 
wrote a memoir of growing up in Dallas, which I don't have the title in front of me. It's like something like from the world in me. Um, yeah. And uh, which is beautiful, but it's about the Kennedy era Dallas, right? right. Which is stigma, stigmatized and scarred by that. Um, it's, a, it's a generation before this. Um, there's a lot of great Dallas writers. Actually. Benjamin, Benjamin Taylor, who just wrote a, a, a memoir of, um, I think his name is Benjamin Taylor. Um, he wrote the, uh, the memoir of Philip Roth this past year. About two years ago, three years ago, he wrote a short memoir of Dallas that I really liked a lot. It's a good book. Check it out. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great city. It's a great place to do, um, to put these teens into trouble um, because it has Highland Park, um, which is sort of the hoity-toity part of the city, um, and where the character Dan Malone gets into a lot of trouble in a police chase. Um, and we have Mavericks games. Mavericks were great back then. Deep Loving, lovingly described. Um, you know, like, like, like so much else in the book, you, when, you're, when you're writing, a, so when you're writing a memoir, you can't really, unless that, unless that Dallas Mavericks game is a game where like something has happened to you, you can't really include it. And yet with a novel, you can, and you kind of cool. almost have to. So what's the difference there? What is the, what is the driving difference that allows you to linger on details that in a memoir would be superfluous? And specifically with the Mavericks game. <laughs> I'm thinking specifically of the Mavericks games and also your dad's job at, at the airline. Okay. I'll talk about both. For the Mavericks game, by the way, that game is set on an actual game night. The Mavs and the Rockets do play on that night. And I do remember watching that game. I had no doubt of that whatsoever. <laughs> but I will tell you, I was not on a date with the love interest <laughs> <laughs> in the book on that, night. that was Katie Bloom, huh? Okay. <laughs> yes. So, um, so that's the novel part <laughs> is the fact that I was kind of like a high school uh, nerd and a loser, and I wasn't going on dates to Mavericks game. But if I were, I would definitely do the uh, twist and shout with her in the fourth yeah. quarter, uh, yeah. which was so much fun at a Mavericks game back in the eighties, and. Um, reunion arena and the whole vibe of it and having to be driven by the the turd of an older brother to the game all of that stuff happened uh, to me on various unsuccessful dates in high school um, but <laughs> but yeah I think that um, I think that I wanted to write that scene as sort of a lo sort of a love poem to um, to the awkward high school date, right? Yeah. So yeah. like the dates that um, are in John Hughes movies are also so well done and whatever, but you're, but like being interrupted all the time by the actual game and the clock and the fact that the brother wants to leave early and the right. fact you can't kiss right. the girl because you're in the back of his Jeep Wrangler and stuff like that. Right. Like it all just is like hinky and awkward like most dates in high school. So that was what that was about. And then thank you for mentioning Pat Malone and the airline stuff. So um, that is a particular thing to Dallas, right? So Dallas was built this huge airport out, out in the middle of Dallas, Fort Worth. Sure. And, uh, and that's the reason my family actually moved um, to Texas from, from the Bronx was that my father worked for American Airlines, much like Pat Malone. And right at the same, right after deregulation, there were these huge airline wars and they happened to be mostly set in Dallas, um, Southwest Airlines versus the major carriers. When we first moved down, Braniff Airline had just gone under and the airline business was very volatile. And so what I was intrigued by that, because in addition to Pat Malone's um, we'll call it the Irish trifecta, which was he was sick with MS. He had a drinking problem. His third problem was his work and that this, this business was not easy um, and it was very up and down um, as with the economy. And so all of these things were added pressures that I wanted to understand in order to, to describe that character. Well, you know, so, so, few, so few novels and so few books in general um, describe work and the frustrations of work and um and this 
book does that really well. I think I told you when we talked the other day on the phone, like my first job was like for like a third ranked trade magazine called Airline Executive. So I know that you got this stuff all right in this book. Um, my favorite stories, and these are real stories. Um, my father uh, worked for American Airlines and then he went to work for Eastern Airlines. And Eastern Airlines up until the end was run by a guy named Frank Borman, who's in this book, Sophomores. Yes. Frank Borman, for those of you who don't know, were, was uh, an astronaut. He was on Apollo 8, I believe, which was the one that went around the moon right before Ap Apollo 11. So they went around to check it out. And uh, I'll never forget my father had to have lunch, I think, once with Frank Borman. And the one thing he said was that he was deaf as a doornail. And I was like, what? And so I went to research, like, why was he? And uh, it's, it's sort of uncomplicated. The fact that you sit on rockets for half of your right. time as a pilot kind of makes you deaf. But also he had dive bombed as an army pilot and blew out his eardrums. Right. So, he, uh, so my father was right. So I sort of fact checked my dad with some of the research I did. And he was completely right. That it was really hard to talk to Borman because he was half deaf. Yeah, I love I love the portrayal of Borman and Bob Crandall and all these you know legendary guys that are kind of like lost to history now. It was it was it was it was really really well done. So, what would you call this book? I know obviously it's a novel. Uh, obviously, it's not a memoir. But I mean, there's all sorts of pe people that are like coming up with like new new names for what was you know called you know plainly for like centuries autobiographical fiction now it's like auto fiction and all these sort of things that sort of are there to make it sound cooler um but what what is this book is it a buildings roman autobiographical novel what would you what would you call it well it has three plots okay it has an education plot a buildings roman for dan the 15 year old kid who's a sophomore okay and then it has the the uh crisis of faith plot with the murder trial for Anne Malone, the mother. And then there's sort of the, the bottoming out, the falling off plot of uh, Pat Malone as he loses his job and, and falls deeper into alcoholism. And so what, I don't know, I'm not sure what you call it, but I will tell you they're all sophomores. They're all very smart people but they're also foolish about, very, they have blind spots. And that's what makes for a great character. Um, and not just, I'm not talking about my book, but just in general. Like you have to have blind spots and characters that you can, you can show to people um, and make you root for them. Uh, so, so that's why I called the book Sophomores. So it's a, it's in a, it's a I mean, it, tucked in this coming of age novel, another word for it, um, isn't, you know, is this addiction novel? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite things. There's a, there's a, a, a section that, um, takes my breath away. Um, it is on, uh, page 226 of the book and it describes, um, Pat Malone waking up in the morning and looking at himself in the mirror with a hangover. And I'm just going to read just a few sentences. Pat stood before the steamed up mirror. His face was gray, minus his nose, which had turned bright red at the tip. Can't shave. He had acne and staph infection on his chin that was irritated and wouldn't close, and his skin felt too raw, thin, and dried out. He combed his hair, his scalp riddled with dandruff and itching madly. He blotted the condensation off the mirror and looked into pink, roomy eyes that ran dry and then too watery. And it goes, it goes on, it goes on for three pages. And I just thought it was a tour de force of two things. Number one, of describing what the bottom three steps away looks like. And then just also a, a triumph of, of truly empathetic writing. And I mean, I was just completely blown away by it. And I wanted to know, do you remember writing it, what it took you to write it, and what it felt like to finish? that section. Yeah. Um, thanks for, for, for reading that. It was really cool to hear you read it, Tom, and I really appreciate these questions. They're terrific. Um, I do remember writing it. I also remember sort of going through it. 
because as they say, a lot of rot goes into an empire. So with drinking, it's like a, it's a compounded effect over time and it takes a long time, even if you quit. And that's the day that Pat Malone in this book quits. It's January 1st, right? It's his yeah. resolution. Well, to he tries to quit, right? Or I mean, yeah. And so he's going to quit drinking, but like, um, the drinking doesn't just make you drunk. It makes your skin bad. It makes your liver bad. It makes everything else hard and difficult. And so that's what I was, I was trying to describe, which is all the rot that goes into the empire. Right. And, uh, it is, uh, it's really, uh, it's really frightening. And it's also just really at that moment for the character, it's like really pathetic. It's like, how can I, how can I face any of this? And I didn't realize that the, the toll, you're always, the characters all like, until they really quit and see it at the end, they're sort of in denial, right? Well, without saying he's killing himself, you're saying he's killing himself. And yeah, I mean, you make that, you make, you make us feel the body that he suddenly has to drag around because he's killing himself. Yeah. That's right. Um, on page 162, there was a sentence that was my aha sentence when I was <laughs> reading it. Um, here it goes. This is, you're talking about Dan Malone, the really, I guess, the, um, the, the character based on you. <laughs> and uh, he goes, um, he tried to convince himself that he didn't want the comments. This, this, he's, he's handed in a journal to Mr. Oglesby, his um, Socratic Jesuit teacher. And he's starting to reveal more and more in those journals. He's also starting to become a writer, but the, the journal, the, the urge to disclose as a writer is, goes right up against his, his journal, his urge to keep secret as a family member. They're at war with each other. And so he's, he's handed his journal in and this is what you write about him. He tried to convince himself that he didn't want the comments to boomerang back to his father or mother, but truth was he wasn't ready to write about those feelings and wasn't sure when he ever would be. And I read that and I was like, I, I tried to imagine what it felt like to write that sentence because well, the book is an announcement that you finally are. You're ready. You're ready. You're ready to write it. And were you aware that you were doing that in that sentence? And is that a message, you know, to the reader about the importance of this book to you? Great, great question. I'll, I'll be honest with you, Tom. It happened. Sometimes you write it and you realize it. And yeah. it and, and it is a it, it was a revelation to me at the moment too that I was trying to dig sort of dig this furrow right or yeah. dig dig this line and uh, and I was ready to do it um, enough time had passed it was very you know like it's very hard for me but also the character of Dan Malone in the book very hard to grow up as a teenager alone uh, you know as an only child and but then to be compounded by watching his father go through MS and go through all of this, it's like, it's really wrenching. It's, it's, um, it's what, it's, it's whatever, what all of us I'm sure on this call have seen when we have family members and friends who go through chronic pain um, or chronic conditions, it's hard. It's to, you know, um, so a lot of it, a lot of the resiliency of being a teenager like Dan Malone is blocking that out and trying to be creative and write. And so I do think there's another scene in the book where he's listening to Bob Dylan and he's starting to get Great into scene. flow state. And I wanted to include that because I always, as a kid, would read dozens of novels, but no one ever ta told you like, well, how do you do it? Right? Like, where's the scene where they, they write the novel? And so I wanted to show the young Dan Malone writing we're trying to write, we're trying to understand symbolism and imagery. And he's in this like near flow state and it's sort of interrupted by his parents arguing. And that's like a, both a subconscious and a direct, like real, like it stops the creativity. It stops the imagination because he has to come back to the hard reality. Right. Um, and, uh, and all of this is, you know, 
And he's also a teenager with hormones and problems and insecurities and anxieties and friends um, um, who are supportive, but then on the next second, you know, they're all kidding each other about it. So it's a complex state. And I'm glad you picked up on that because that's exactly right, is that the create creativity is almost an escape at that point. And he doesn't he doesn't want to write about that. Right. Yeah. He he wants to go off and do what Bob Dylan did, right? Go to Greenwich Village, move to New York, pretend to be some sort of like Western, like heroic figure. Oh, yeah, hobo, hobo poet. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So when you know there's there's a certain feeling that you get when you're writing a book when it's the book that you have to write, the book that I'm writing to me, you know, is, is definitely the book that I have to write before I can sort of take any further steps. Um, and I felt that in, in your book, I felt that in this book, there's a, there's an electricity to it. Um, even though in a lot of ways it's a, it's a quiet book, but there's a, there's a real, there's a real electricity to me from first to last page. Is this the book that you had to write? I, I do, and I'll tell you why. Again, coming back to empathy and these characters who I love and admire. Um, I love my friends. Um, there are three of them mentioned in the book, Rick Dallern, Rob McGee, Steve O'Donnell. They real names? Those are real names, those are real. Oglesby, real name? Sorry? Oglesby is also a real name? Is that his, is that the name of your teacher? Yeah, Mr. Oglesby is a real, okay. a real person, as is Mr. Donahue, my history okay. teacher. Um, and I really just love and admire um, these people and I wanted to give them a great run, right? Like I wanted them to be the best versions of themselves in this book. And so I, I tried, I tried, I tried my best to do that. Um, but, um, but most importantly, um, you know, I just wanted to um, use, the, use the sophomore's conceit for explaining um, to myself first as the first reader and sort of the first critic of my, my own thoughts and, and my own background and whatever, that like, you have to give people a break. Everybody is smart about something and dumb about something else. Yeah. And, and so that's what the sophomore's conceit is for me, is that, um, is that everyone's uh, uneven, but like, people will save you. Mr. Oglesby literally saved me. My friends literally saved me. My parents... And by the way, I'm making making this out to sound like a really heavy book. There is a lot of funny shit it's in the funny. book. Excuse yeah. me, yeah, <laughs> excuse yeah. my language, but there is a lot of funny stuff that uh, happens. There's a great uh, the swim team goes on a trip to San Antonio with bad. Yeah, I laughed out loud, literally. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Oglesby for everything yeah. for every stricture, he's also hilarious. And he was like a walking far side cartoon in terms of quotes and, and absurdities. And he's just really smart and just had a drop on his students. And he's so quick. Mr. Donahue is like the greatest in real life and in the book, the greatest history teacher. He makes World War I and it come to life better than Barbara Tuckman. Like he, these people are amazing characters. I had to write, you're exactly right, Tom. I had to write this book before all else. And, uh, and it was just because, uh, they meant so much to me and they sent me on my way. How did you figure out what to leave out? <laughs> I, read, I read that I was like, oh man, you, I mean, you, 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 you shape a lot into uh, a highly readable, less than 400 page book. How did you do it? And how long, how long did it take you? Please don't tell me this was your first draft, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, this took me five, six, about five or six years and I had a great editor. Um, Gabby Mangelli from Putnam. Um, she was amazing. So the first book is, the first draft was definitely about 30% longer. And uh, we, uh, like any author, you know, I've worked with authors for 25 years, so I should get it. I should be like, kill your darlings, revise, revise, edit it down. It always sounds better at half the length, right? I fought like tooth and nail for stories and, and uh, there are some things that fell out. Um, Maybe uh, maybe we'll do a, a director's cut someday. But there is one story in, um, that involved a, a friend of mine. The real life person is B.J. Kelly, and it's a great scene. It's just a scene to go back to the Greeks in the underworld. And so we go to the Dallas Sportatorium one night, 
and we watched the Von Erichs wrestle. And the Von Erichs were this huge Dallas pro wrestling uh, family, struck with tragedy. It's a crazy story. I'll try to put it out some somehow. But that was like a real Dallas moment. That It just killed me to take this out because the Von Erichs, like I know they're Dallas people on the call right now, and they're all like, oh, of course, the Von Erichs. You have to put the Von Erichs in a Dallas book. Um, but I didn't live in Dallas long enough to know the Von Erichs. <laughs> they're, uh, they're like out, talk about Greek tragedy, that family. But anyhow, um, and, but there was other stuff that fell out of the book, but it all sharpened and tightened it, I have to admit. Um, even taking our cat Caesar out of the book, which uh, if you don't, if you're upset about that, like I am still, it's a Gabby Mangelli, Putnam Books, 1745 Broadway. <laughs> Your letters. <laughs> um, before we get to questions, I, I do I have one more question for you. Um, at the end of your acknowledgem, acknowledgments, you say, I miss you, Dad. And, you know, when you read the book where um, the character of, uh, of Pat Malone is, is really just getting an inkling of, um, of the light that he might follow yet, um, and then, you know, you, the experience as the reader is, of course, you don't know what happens to him. And then you cut forward to saying, I miss you, dad. And so you know that your dad is, has passed away. When did, when did your dad die? And did it have anything to do with his drinking? Or was, was it the fun, final episode of, of the MS? No, it was, it was MS related in, in uh, yeah. 2001. So he died October 31st, 2001. Okay. Um, so to my father's credit, I just want to say that um, um, he had a MS diagnosis for over 20 years. He was uh, an amazing, resilient person who did physical therapy exercise. It's really sad now to look back 20 years later and realize they didn't even really know what MS was at the time, right. like and what, right. what, how it was affecting the body. And you read stuff now about inflammation and uh and others and and you know the myelin wrappers and yeah. around the nerves and stuff like that i don't even know if we had knowledge of that in the 80s and 90s to be honest if with you. at all it was just beginning yeah and so there was there's a scene in the book um there's a chapter in the book which is a is sort of like a private diary yeah for uh pat malone and it, one of the scenes in that involves going to a f sort of like a um, like a f like an MS fair where they're trying all of these different you know trials um, to figure it out, and he comes away depressed from it. Um, and that's me uh, speaking a little bit for him that we didn't really know what it was, and and like MS is really insidious in the sense of you know one day you're you feel like you can run a half, you can run five miles and the next day you can't get out of bed. So it, it's up and down. It's hard. Um, but he was a very resilient, never complained. The folks on this call who know my father, the most honest, sincere, gracious man. Um, I do miss him greatly. Um, but I have um, his voice in my head. I have this book and I have uh, my son, <laughs> Dan. Um, who's who named after you? Yeah, who he'd be very yeah. proud of. Yeah. Well, um, it was uh, it was it was wonderful, and his voice is in my head now. So uh, <laughs> good. <laughs> um, that's great, Tom. Thanks for um, everybody. I, I swear, there's a lot of humor in the book. It's not this heavy <laughs> all the time. <laughs> But thank you, Tom. That was wonderful. What the questions you asked, I really appreciate it. Well, let's let's get to that Q and A. All right. Um, so we have a first question from Sally Kim. Um, when did you start writing the story? I think you mentioned five or six years ago. But also, how did you know you were ready? Which I think is interesting. It's an interesting, yeah. So, um, the short version. I quit drinking nine years ago, and about a year in, I decided as a therapeutic exercise to write about the best summer of my life where I was a lifeguard at Glen Cove Swim Club. And I wrote, in 90 days, I think I wrote 90,000 words. It just poured out of me because it was so much fun. It was cathartic. 
to write about a good time. Um, and then out of that, I had these characters all of a sudden. I had the Malone family. And so I put them to use in sophomore. So the whole thing takes nine years. And like everyone who sort of quits drinking and goes into recovery, and there's always a moment where you turn around and you're like, what was that all about? Where, how did we get there? You know, how did we get here? Um, and so that was part of the exploration of the book. Um, thanks, uh, Sally. By the way, Sally's my publisher. Oh, and, uh, I we have just, a couple of questions from Sally, so. I just want to clarify for everyone on the call that Sally Kim was not actually banned for life from the clay pot in Park Slope. Um, there's been a lot of rumors online about that. She's not banned for life from the clay pot and uh, she's a really great publisher. Um, Jenna Lehman wants to know, how did you find time to write a novel while simultaneously running a publishing company? Um, I got up, a, I got up a little earlier. <laughs> um, I find that I, um, this is my advice to writers, just write a page every day. I don't care what it is, but get 300 words or whatever your goal is for the day. And guess what? After the end of a year, you have 300 pages or so, you'll have a lot, right? Now, I did a lot of outlining, I did a lot of research, I did a lot of work behind that, but don't be scared of the, of the, uh, the blank page, write through it. And so that's what I did, is I just wrote through it. And uh, I picked it up every morning around six and tried to get it done before the email and the phone and the, the day job started. That sounds a lot more feasible than <laughs> I think writing a novel often can feel. Um, so we have one question from an anonymous attendee, which is, they would love to hear about your experience having your first novel adapted to film. And they're wondering, do you write with movie adaptation in mind? Have you imagined this novel sophomores as a film as well? Well, I hope this anonymous person is Richard Linklater and they <laughs> feel free to option the rights and make it into a movie. Um, thank you for the, for the question, Richard. Um, I, uh, the first book was like, um, was a wonderful piece of luck that it um, actually got made. So my first novel was called Adam's Fall and the elevator pitch is The Shining Goes to Harvard. Okay, so this kid is a senior at Harvard. He starts to lose it, starts to see ghosts in his old dorm. And it was optioned by Linda Opst at Paramount. And she called me and said, I have this great young screenwriter. And the uh, and he's gonna do yours next. He just has to finish this other project. And that other project, the one before mine, was something called Traffic. And the screenwriter was Stephen Gagan, and he won an Oscar for that. So in Hollywood world, I was next in line from an Academy Award winning screenwriter. So my stuff, by just luck of the draw, got greenlit and they made the movie. And uh, they turned my character, me, into Katie Holmes, which I think, that, I think that's right. I think they did a good job of that. <laughs> that's so cool. Um, Wayne Kofi wants to give Tom a shout out for a superb piece you wrote about the Ebenezer Baptist Church for the Undefeated. Um, and then his question for Sean, it <laughs> has to do with, um, he was really struck by how your novel explores the pain and raging dysfunction of alcoholism. And he thinks you write about that with extraordinary candor. Um, and he asks if anyone in your family dealt with that. And you said, yes. And, you know, I think, but it would be great if you could speak more to just the process of depicting that um, in this book. Well, you know, there, I guess there's like two, two forces both in reality and in writing about it. One is this constant state of denial while things are getting worse. And two, there is a quality to, I'd say, active functional alcoholics of, I can fix this shit. I'm sorry, I shouldn't curse. I can fix this, right? And so that's what we watch the character of Pat Malone go through. As I said, I was interviewed, um, you just think you can paddle the canoe a little faster, but in fact, there's a big leak in the boat and it's sinking. And so um, it's, a, it's a, again, a wise, foolish sort of thing. It's a sophomore effort to, like, um, to think, oh, you know what? I can compartmentalize. I can rationalize. Um, I can outthink it. I can outsmart it. I can outsmart everybody else. 
it's um and in terms of all of those things um it's a it's a classic state of denial which makes it for makes for a really compelling character because they're facing the 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 sort of dark energy of their problems but also the sort of compounding problems that they're creating for themselves in the universe so did the drinking lead to the ms the ms compound the drinking did all of that lead to pat malone losing his job at american airlines or or other things like it's all a big circle and it just sort of starts to snowball so i thought that that's what i tried to do there and it is an insidious disease and and uh i just want to say to all my friends who i've faced down their substance abuse problems that we're just doing really well one day at a time all we have to do today is not drink and be fine with each other and uh, to love one another and support people who have this problem because it is a disease um another question from sally kim the scene where pat goes out to find dan in the storm and ends up where he ends up doesn't want to give any spoilers still takes her breath away did you plan to write did you plan for that scene to go where it does go and was it difficult to write very difficult to write um you know there's a there's a class there's sort of a trope in literature of the of the sort of the the last moment of like raging against the storm you have it in king lear but you also have it in a lot of irish literature like the mad king sweeney um you have uh uh, a, a classic book by Hugh Leonard or, or play by Hugh Leonard Da where he goes out and actually the, the dog drowns it's very similar to the scene in my book there's like there's like uh, there's a lot of scenes like this and what I thought was difficult about it was the fact that that was a scene that could happen to the character of Pat Malone and he knowingly would do that knowing that his father, Jack Malone, during the 1939 hurricane, had done basically the same jackass routine of like going out drunk into the storm for God knows what. Um, so the, again, the curse, to bring it back to the Greeks, the curse is the repeating pattern of the problem from generation to generation. Um, another anonymous attendee Kind of, kind of in the same or similar line of the last couple of questions. What toll did this novel take on you um, psychologically and emotionally given like the nature of the material and how did you cope during the writing process? Yeah, it did, it, it, you know, it, it is cathartic for me to talk about this stuff and to write about it. Again, I wanna stress to all my friends that it, there's some laughs in here too. <laughs> no, it wasn't always, so I think that's how I balanced it, is that um, for every moment where we're talking about King Lear, we're gonna have a Falstaff moment too, okay? We're gonna have levity, we're gonna have comedy and tragedy, and what we have really in the old term is the family romance, right? Um, where things are up and down and sideways and go, uh, go, go all over. So that's, that's, li that's life, or that's art imitating life at its best, where it's up and down. And there are such, I have to say, again, to my friends and my family, to my teachers who I admire, these are great characters and you guys are gonna love them. Um, I hope I've done them justice. Um, Christy Tate wants to know, who was your favorite Von Erich? <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. Thank you for that question, Christy. By the way, for those of you on the call, if you haven't already, pick up Group by Christy Tate, a terrific book by my former St. Rita's classmate. Um, talk about, Tom, talk about a bare and honest memoir. This is an amazing book. Congratulations, Christy. Um, now back to the van, Von Erichs. Um, I'd have to say, is it Carrie? Who was the one who was sort of Conan the Barbarian the cowboy it's carrie right i think that has to be my favorite um uh so carrie von eric um if it's not if that's not carrie it's the guy with the long hair um who was the texas tornado um i know probably in the chat right now i'm getting corrected but i think it's carrie <laughs> 
Um, Christina Powers wants to know what books have you enjoyed reading for fun recently? Um, gosh, um, over the holidays, I did a little John Le Carre, um, which was fantastic, um, and Iris Murdoch, which for all my English major friends, uh, go back to Iris Murdoch. It's a real payoff. The Black Prince, The Sea, The Sea, Under the Net, they're all amazing. What I'm really excited for, um, which I picked up at Community Bookstore, is The Prophets, um, mm. published by Sally Kim. She's a very talented publisher. Um, <laughs> um, book by Robert Jones just looks amazing. Has an amazing quote from Marlon James. And if you haven't read The Brief History of Seven Killings, uh, published and edited by my friend Jake Morrissey, an amazing book about Jamaica, Bob Marley, the assassination attempt. Talk about multiple characters and voices and ghosts. Amazing book. So I'm very excited for The Prophets. Um, and uh, thanks for the question. <laughs> Speaking of books to be excited about, Lisa Amon wants to know if you can give us a hint about the important book you're currently writing. The current one I'm wor working on? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, no. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> it's not, it's not I, I apologize, but it's not cooked, so I can't talk about it, or otherwise... Is, is it another novel, or is it a nonfiction book? I'm very superstitious. As you'll see right reading this book, I'm very Irish. I don't talk about stuff. I feel like I'll jinx it, or it'll lose, it'll lose some elemental power if I talk about it too soon. Hmm. Hmm. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> um... Uh, Melissa Tyson wants to know if you could touch on the soundtrack or the songs mentioned throughout the book. How much was imagined versus how much were actual songs that marked the adventures of the character or your adventures when you were young? I have to say another question from someone who actually appears in the novel Sophomores. <sighs> Melissa Dallard. Um, yeah, we have a soundtrack. This is so cool. So Putnam created this soundtrack for all the stuff that's in the in the book, all the music that's touched on. So we have some great 80s stuff, like When Smokey Sing and Tears for Fears and uh, great stuff if you want to slow dance in 1988 or are too afraid to slow dance and you just want to wander around the dance floor. Um, then there's um, a lot of Bob Dylan, because that's what I sort of listen to, um, to listen to in my bedroom to, uh, a million times, like so many kids, right? Um, Cause I had that thing to escape with. And then there's all this great Irish music on there too. The Clancy brothers being preeminent. So for all our Irish music fans out there, there's plenty of Clancy brothers live at Carnegie Hall, the parting glass, the Irish Rover. So I'm, ge I'm getting all of the generations and all the sort of genres of, of music put out there. And including of course, one of my father's favorite musicals, uh, Carousel, and the song You'll Never Walk Alone, which uh, has like this bittersweet moment in the book. Um, Annette Kazmarski wants to know, was there an inspiration for the name Katie Bloom? She thought of Molly Bloom, Caddy Compson, and in general, just you could speak more to how you were situating this in kind of an Irish tradition or, or other traditions. Hi, Annette, nice to hear from you. Uh, Katie, um, Katie just sounds like a Texas name to me. That's just <laughs> well, the way you spell it, C A D Y. Yeah, yeah. Right. And there is a Katie, Texas, I believe, but it's spelled differently. I got it. But A T Y. Yeah, yeah. It sounded like, uh, and then Bloom. Yeah, there is, there is in my little geeky English major way. There's these little drops of Joyce throughout the book. Um, so, like Oglesby's stick is called Ash Plant. Uh, there's, uh, you know, dark and fierce faces of the sophomores. There's these little touches of what is um, a much better and more important book than mine, A Portrait of the Artist and the Young Man. But it's a book about a kid who goes through a Jesuit prep school education. And so I felt necessary to drop a little bit of Joyce in that. Also, Annette, you were an English major with me at, in college. We had to, we got to use this, this trivia somewhere. <laughs> Um, and then our final question, kind of going back to something that was discussed a little bit at the beginning of the discussion, but Mary Rainix wants to know if you could talk about 
writing about a time and a youth without the internet, cell phones, and constant communication digitally? Did it make you wistful for that era, and what did it make you miss the most? Well, we talked a little bit about that and how it made for better dialogue, mm -hmm. I thought. But what I really loved about it was the fact that we were bored. And so there's a funny scene in the book where um, Steve O'Donnell, who is a conflation in the book of a few different characters, and Dan Malone, they just start prank calling people, which is kind of what you did um, when you were bored. Um, and so we started prank calling girls, prank calling uh, funny names in the phone book, kind of like Bart Simpson calls Mo at the tavern, you know? And so like, that was, this is how we entertained ourselves. That and uh, the Commodore 64 or whatever it was at the time, you know, with the disk drive that was like the size of the, half the size of the desk <laughs> and stuff. And you, um, so we were, we were much, we were much more bored. So we were much more creative about entertaining ourselves. That's how I'd answer that. Well, I think that's all the time we have. So many great questions from the audience. Thank you. And thank you so much, Sean and Tom. This was lovely. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Sean, for answering all my questions and for writing uh, a, a truly lovely book. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. It was such a pleasure. You're, you're so terrific to do this with me. It was such a treat to talk to you guys, and I want to talk to you all individually. And so come summer, I'm coming to see you all, and we'll do it in person okay. as well. And thank you all for the support and the love, and enjoy sophomores. I really tried, folks. I hope you love it. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, Camille. Bye. Bye. Thank you.